Lord, we thank you just for that opening. We thank you that you are here. We thank you that we are children of you. We praise you and glorify you this morning in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to just introduce you uh, to Seth Barron. Uh, he's one of my friends. Uh, we've been friends for almost two years now. And I knew when uh, Angie let me know that she was not going to be here uh, this week, I just felt like he was the guy to ask. And, and uh, I'm just so thankful for him and, and his family's right there in the back row, the, uh, Kendra and the, the girls and, and I forget, uh, son as well. So just welcome them. Just want to mention a couple things. Uh, we're in the End Commandments series, uh, started last week, and uh, if you haven't joined up with a small group, there's small groups back at the table. You can sign up with that, talk to the different leaders. Uh, Steve's one of those. Uh, hello, Steve. So, so, so Steve's one, Ellen's another, say hello, Ellen, all right, um, I, I'm another, and, and uh, so pick, pick us out, and Tony's another, thank you for, 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 for waving, I almost forgot, but uh, so we, we, we uh, want to welcome you here this morning, this is a good day, we uh, just are excited about what God has in store, uh, I do want to turn it over to Randy, he has a special announcement that I have no idea what it is. So, it's October, but, so. October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and uh, we would like to just show you our appreciation and uh, let you know that we love you and glad you're back from vacation <laughs> and, uh, Continue to stay. We'd miss you if you were gone anywhere. So, <laughs> well, thank uh, you. Appreciate that. You bet. So, thank you. Thank you, you Randy. You bet. You bet. Thanks, Jim. So thankful for Randy and his leadership. Uh, you might not know he's the vice chair of the board. He's, he does great leadership uh, for you guys and, and, and helps lead the board uh, really well. Uh, with that, I want to ask the uh, ushers to please come forward and we'll take our, our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are so good. You are awesome. You are powerful. You are mighty. And we just want to thank you for meeting with us here. We just want to be able to give back to you during this time because we know that you blessed us so we can bless other people. So we give back to you. We give back to your church. We give back to your ministry during this time. This is an honor. This is a privilege that we are able to do, to give back to you and say that we love you through our tithes and offerings. So we praise you in your name. Amen. Lord, we hold on to that promise this morning. We hold on to you. We hold on to the fact that we know that you'll never let go of us. We know through the storm, through the valleys, through all, all the things that we go through, we know that you are there for us. You are walking alongside with us. You are picking us up when we can't carry ourselves. You, you hold on to us. Lord, thank you for never letting go. Thank you for never letting go of us. No matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, you are there right with us all along the way. Lord, you are awesome. You are powerful. You are mighty. Your compassion is, is like no other. Your strength, oh, I can't even imagine. Lord, we hold on to you. Lord, continue to hold on to us, and we will try to continue to hold on to you. Lord, we think of the things that are going on this morning. People are hurting. People are struggling. We, we, we know that, Lord. We, we think of Esther, who, who's in, in the nursing home. Lord, be with her. Let, her. let her know that you are there with her. Lord, we think of uh, those that might be struggling with sickness, with pneumonia, or whatever it might be. Lord, we, we think of those people today. Lord, be with them. Touch them. Please be with those that weren't able to be here today because of sickness or traveling or whatever it might be. Lord, be with them. Let them know that, that you are with them no matter where they're at. Lord, help us to be the church. Help us to be the people that you want us to be. To the, the called out ones, that's what church means. The called out ones, those, those are that are taking a stand for you. Those, those that are loving people no matter who they are, no matter the difficulty, no matter if we're, we're the ones that are, 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 are the ones that are hard to love sometimes. Lord, we pray today that you will 
awaken us. You will give us hope. You will give us the strength we need to continue to get on to the next day, to the next moment. Lord, and so many people today may be fearful, fearful of whatever it may be, Lord. I pray today that you will redeem them from that fear, that you will strengthen them, that they will know that they can be strong and courageous because they have you alongside of them. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we glorify you today. In your name, amen. You may be seated. At this time, all kids up to sixth grade can be dismissed. Get the opportunity this morning to not just hear from me, but uh, 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 another friend. Uh, a lot of you know him, uh, Chad. So this is kind of a tag team sermon. I did this a few years ago with, with Curtis, and now we uh, get to do it today with Chad. So I uh, hope you'll enjoy uh, what God's uh, prepared for this morning. Last week we started a series called The End Commandments. And I told you I wasn't going to tell you what it was about, which is weird because if you start a series, shouldn't you know what it's about? Are you ready to hear what it's about? Sure. Give me a couple minutes. I'll, I'll warm up to it. So, so I'm not quite there yet. But last week, last week we talked about uh, the, the, being faithful to the gospel. We talked about the resurrection. We talked about that's what we need to live like. We need to live the resurrection. We need to learn to offer grace and we need to learn to trust the Father. That's how we get to, to, to live the resurrection. We offer grace and trust the Father in good, in bad, in hard times, and that's where we come from. So what are the end commandments? The end actually stands for not. Jesus, while on this earth, told us not to do some things. Not to do some things. Now, it's interesting because a lot of people think, well, isn't Christianity all about the knots? No, not necessarily. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't behave like this. Don't do that. But these, these are some different knots. These, these are, in fact, almost impossible to live up to. So if Jesus said it, is it possible? And I think that it is. Some of these end commandments, these not commandments, are fear not, worry not, doubt not. And there's two others that will surprise you in the coming weeks. But today we're going to fear, focus on fear not. So fear not, worry not, and doubt not. Those are the next three weeks. Fear not, worry not, doubt not. But today we're going to be in Matthew 10, 28 through 31, and we're going to read that. If you want to join me in all uh, three verses, that would be great. Four verses. Since it's a short one today. Uh, and the words are going to be on the screen up there. So if you don't have a Bible, you can read off of that as well. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. May this be real. May this seep into our hearts and, and, and lead us into to a life that is abundant uh, following you, Lord Jesus. In your name, amen. In that passage that we just read, and in the few, few verses before that, he actually says, do not be afraid, three different times in that short passage. Do not be afraid. There must be something about it that he says what, this three times in, in just a few sentences. It must be important. So I want to ask you today, what do you fear? And I want you to turn to a neighbor friend that you know well, and, and maybe talk to, to tell them one thing 
that you fear. It could be something like Indiana Jones and his, his fear of snakes. And, and it could be like a many, many Americans and, and their fear of public speaking. Just turn to a neighbor in uh, about, about 10 seconds and tell them what, what, what you're afraid of. A little awkward. We've never done this before, but you can talk. It's okay. It's talk. Talk. All right, so, so a lot, lot of different fears, a lot of different variety of fears. A lot of different fears. I want to tell you what one of my fears is. In fact, I not only fear something, but I experienced it this past week. I was with Jenny, and we went to St. Louis. Anybody ever been to the National, uh, Jefferson National Expansion Memorial? Wait, that doesn't sound familiar, right? It's, it's the Gateway Arch, okay? Like, that, that's the official name for it. And I'm like, when I'm coming up along it, and I'm like, Jefferson, what, what is that? You know, I, I, I didn't understand what it was. But I came up to it and saw it. And, and, and so show that, yeah, there's, there's the arch. There, there's the old cathedral right in front of it. it it's, it's a pretty big building. Now, we, we, we walked a little bit closer, and that, that's the next picture here. Jenny and... and very, very good-looking woman there. Uh, but we're getting very close to the arch. And, and you're starting to see the actual size of it. All right, the next picture. Th this is looking straight up. 630 feet in the air. It, it's crazy. Did, did I mention yet that I'm scared of heights? That, 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 that's my fear. But I, but I feel like I've been up in, in, in some tall buildings before, like the Empire State Building. Anybody ever been up in the Empire State Building? That, that's pretty cool. I've been up in the CN Tower in, in Toronto, the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Uh, but nothing prepared me quite for this. We, 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 we went inside, and don't go to the next picture yet. But I, 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 we, we were waiting in, in, in this line. And, and, and we basically get up to this line that you're like right, waiting in a roller coaster. They have different sections waiting for the next ride to come up, right? And, and, and right in front of us, I see this little four-foot door. And I'm thinking, are we going to go in that four-foot door? This is a small door. And so then we hear this kind of loud creaking noise, and these four-foot doors open. And basically what I see is this next picture. This, this, what they called capsule. Now, I, I, I don't know what your experiences with capsules are, but I usually swallow them so I cannot have pain. Right? They're small. And, and, and this capsule is small. So basically, we get into the small little capsule, and we sit down on these small little chairs really small little chairs. I felt like I was a little kid because my knees were up basically in my face and, and, and Jenny was right here and, and two of my closest friends, or at least they became my closest friends, I didn't know who they were beforehand, were right there. But he, and, and I never thought I, I was claustrophobic before. But, but this made me feel like I was claustrophobic. So, so not, now not, not only am I scared of heights, and I'm going up in, in, in this really tall arch. Not a building, but an arch. Because it defies all gravity and all, all these different physics and things like that. It, it's, a, it's an arch. So there's nothing underneath you, right? So, so, so you, you, you get in these. You didn't, didn't buckle up. I wish there was a buckle. But it, even, even if it fell, I, there was nothing I was going to do. I was just going to see Jesus. That's the only thing that, that, that was going to happen. So, so we start going up. And it was the longest four minutes of my life. Four minutes going up the arch. I don't know what I was expecting with, with the arch. I, you know, I was expecting an elevator, but I knew it was going to work like an elevator because it's an arch. You don't go up in an elevator like that. It, it was made, and actually this weekend, they're celebrating 50 years. How many of you own something that is 50 years old? And you're trusting it with your life. <laughs> yes, Dick does. He, he has a very nice car that's 50 years old. But... <sighs> 
You're going up in this capsule that is old and, and makes noises and you just don't trust it. You give, finally get up to the top and, and this next picture is, is what you see. It, it was pretty tall. It was pretty high. I, I wasn't ecstatic about it. Um, I wasn't really enjoying myself. I, I was ready to go down about 20 seconds after I got up top. It, it, it is just one of those scary, scary, scary things. But I didn't let, I didn't let my fears decide what I was going to do. do. I didn't let my fears make my decisions for me. I didn't want that. But I wanted to actually go up and, and, and see and look around. And, and, and it didn't hurt that I was speaking about fear. And I knew that I was going to be speaking about fear. And I knew I couldn't walk away from it. Because I knew I would have to tell you guys about it. I couldn't let fear make my decisions for me. That's the big idea today. Don't let fear make your decisions for you. Now, Andy Stanley had a different way of wording it. He says, you don't have to be afraid even when there is something to be afraid of. You don't have to be afraid even when there is something to be afraid of. Just like the disciples. They went out on the water with Jesus and there was this big old furious storm. You can read about it in Matthew 8 if you, if you really want to check it out. But I, I, I just want to share it with you about it. On this storm, they, 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 they're starting to freak out. Now, some of the disciples are fishermen. They're on this boat. And, and, and the, the disciples are starting to freak out. And they're, they think they're going to die. So they turn to Jesus. And he is sleeping. Now, I was not going to sleep in that capsule. And, and I'm not sure how Jesus was sleeping in the boat. In fact, I, I kind of question, was he pretending trying to sleep? You know, was he trying just to test the disciples and see what he was going to do? Because this is a storm. But if anybody's going to be able to sleep during a storm, Jesus is going to be able to sleep during a storm. So they wake him up and he, they say this, Lord, save us, we are going to drown. Not like that. They, they said it like this, Lord, save us! right? We're going to drown. Like, they were completely scared. They were out of their mind. They thought they were going to die. They were scared. They were scared out of their minds. Jesus says, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? That's a good question to ask. Why are we so afraid of different things? Why are we so afraid of different things happening? Why am I so afraid of heights? Why is Indiana Jones so afraid of snakes? Well, you can answer that in, in, in the movie. But there, there's these things that are going on in our life that, that hold us almost prisoner to, to, to the fears that we have. That, that's kind of like the song that we, we, we opened up with. No longer slaves. We don't have to be slaves to fear because we know God has us. He has our back and he's not going to let us go. He's going to be with us every step of the way. But it's a good question to ask. Why are we so afraid of these things that really are temporary? It goes back to the passage that we opened up. Why, why are you so afraid of the things that can only hurt your body rather than hurt your body and your soul? Because there's more to us than a body. There's more to us than, than, than these fragile things that will eventually fall apart, wither and fade, and die. There's more to us than that. There's a soul. There's a soul that will live forever. So, so, so we, we need to learn to be afraid of the things that ha can, 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 can destroy our body and our soul. But here, Jesus, Jesus rebukes the winds, waves, and then it was completely calm. Now, I don't think it was just talking about the waves. I think it was also talking about the disciples. They were speechless. They were all, all freaking out in their shocked kind of way. They didn't know how to react. And, and what did they say? What did they say? What kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. 
But I want to go back to the question that they asked. What kind of man is this? The disciples had been traveling with them for a little bit now. They had seen some miracles happen. And they say, what kind of man is this? Now, they know that he is the son of God. But this is the question they ask. What kind of man is this? They don't think they understand who he is and they're right. They don't. As much as they could understand at that point, they could not understand the full truth of who he was. They needed to learn to understand. They needed to learn faith. They needed to understand to trust Jesus. The question is, how do we learn to trust? How do we learn to trust? How, how, how can we put fear aside and learn to trust? And Chad's going to come right now and talk to us about that. Don't forget this. Hello. All right, I am Chad, for those of you that don't know me. And I've been coming here about three years, a little over three years. But my kids, they've been coming here for about 13. And I just didn't grow up in church. I know a lot of you guys um, probably did grow up in the church, and it's all you've known, and there's probably some that didn't. But I didn't grow up in church. And uh, my parents didn't. Their parents didn't. So it's just the way I grew up. I mean, I was raised with Christian values, and we were taught not to uh, judge people, that we should help wherever we could, and we were raised right. We just weren't church people, but that's just the way I grew up, and it wasn't until my grandpa, Edelman, was passing away. There was a hospice pastor that would come to the house, also named Nathan, Nathan Frazee, and uh, he was cool, laid back. He had a cool car. Used to bring his grandson over, and we'd have cookies and stuff with him, and we were just talking. But little did I know that he was sneaking the gospel in on me, and so we were actually just talking about life, and he was talking about the Bible, and he was comparing them, and it was a way that I could relate to it, to my own life. So we started going to his church for a little bit, and we got baptized in the backyard at my grandparents' house, sprinkled, but I didn't really know what that meant, what it fully involved, the surrender. I just wanted to do it because my dad and my brother were doing it, and my grandpa just passed away, and it was a good m moment. And, uh, but I graduated. I started working, and I quit going to church. Nathan moved away to Missouri, and it was, uh, I was out in the world, and I didn't have that. Um, I didn't have that faith. I didn't grow up with Jesus, and I didn't have that to turn to, so I was afraid a lot. I had a lot of things in my life that were scary. I had uh, ADD my whole life, and I didn't know until my 30s. So when I talked to people, I always felt like I was different. I felt like I was stupid, really. And um, what I was going to say was going to come out wrong. So I was always looking at people and seeing, did I think I just said something stupid? Or what are they thinking about me right now? Or I always looked up to everybody because I always felt lower than them. So I feared that. And I feared... We started a family early, and I had kids, and I wasn't ready for that. My friends were in college, and I wanted to go with them, and I wanted to drink, and I wanted to have fun. And I did that way more than I should have. And I wasn't a good husband or father. I ended up getting divorced. And uh, my ex-wife Annie moved here with Scott, and the kids started coming here. So they are actually raised in this church, which I'm thankful for every day. And it wasn't again until... I was married, me and Tammy got married, and I was around her mom that I saw faith again, and I heard about the Bible. And uh, I still wasn't a believer like she was, and me and her dad would joke around a lot and laugh and kind of tease her a little bit, because she'd read the Bible and be like, amen, hallelujah, and we were like, oh, whatever. And I'd see stuff on Facebook, people with posting stuff about Jesus, and who would do that? But uh, they would post stuff about Jesus, and I'm like, oh, those Jesus freaks, why are they putting this on my page? And um, I just didn't get it. And Roby didn't really believe either, my father-in-law. He grew up on a tobacco farm, and he grew up tough, a tough life. And he was a water well driller. He was out of state most times. And uh, he just, he believed in God, kind of like I did, but didn't know Jesus. But he found out he had Lou Gehrig's disease. 
And he could have went two ways with it. He could have blamed God, and he could have been angry, and the pain that he already had in his life, and the resentment, and the love he didn't think he felt, he could have just took that with him. But that disease by itself is a good example of today's message. Do not fear the one that can destroy the body, because that's what Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS does, it destroys the muscles in your body till you can't walk, till you can't move your arms, till you're just in bed, until your lungs shut down and you pass away. But if he didn't went that route, it's a trap. Because if we get trapped in that, the devil wants us, because he can do nothing else. After he's trapped us with that lie, he can't take away our soul, but he keeps us in that trap just long enough to die. And then we go to Jesus, and we don't know him. So then he sends us, and we stay in that trap for eternity. That's why he went the other way. He surrendered his life to Jesus. And he feared the one who could destroy the body and the soul. And I, first time I'd ever seen transformation, surrender, real love. And he forgave people, asked for forgiveness. He was a totally different man. He found peace in his heart. He wasn't scared. He wasn't afraid to die because he knew where he was going. He knew his home was in heaven, and he had that spirit in his heart already. So when he did pass away, he didn't have that fear of death because he was just going home. So I took that with me. And during that time, too, there's another... It was a big moment in my life. And I got baptized still, not really knowing what it all entailed. I saw it, but it didn't click to me yet, I guess. I didn't know enough about Jesus to see where he was at. But I got baptized there also. I guess it took three times. He really had to work on me. But uh, I got baptized there also. And we came back here, came back home after he had passed away. And it wasn't long after that the kids were telling us about this new pastor at church. It was a younger guy, and he thought that we'd like him, so we checked it out. And Nathan was, yeah, he's all right. <laughs> but uh, he explained the Bible, too, in a way that I could understand it. Took life and the Bible, put them together, and I could relate. I could relate to the stories in the Bible. I could relate to things, and I wish I wouldn't have. Because some days it seemed like no one else was in here. And Nathan was just walking up to me and going, you shouldn't drink on the weekends. You should lead your family. I mean, the stuff that I was getting. Sorry. From the Holy Spirit that was working on my life and softening my heart <clears throat> and convicting me of my sins was working on me all the time. And finally, about a month after we started coming here, we come every Sunday. And he had a message on being all in. Cheers. Being all in for Christ. And I finally got it. I finally, I could see, I went back to Roby. I saw how he was all in. He gave everything. He surrendered everything that he had. Knowing he was dying, not afraid, not resentful. He just was at peace. And I got it. I saw the things I wanted to change. I saw the things, the person I wanted to be. I wanted to lead my family. And I couldn't understand why he would die for me because I didn't deserve it I didn't earn it I didn't do anything but he died he got he was punished he was beaten he was whipped he was spit on he was kicked he had to drag a tree up a hill all the time pushing me back saying no no I got this I'm doing this for you but why I didn't do anything to earn it and then he died for me and he was raised back to life. And that gratefulness is the heart that I have. That eternal gratefulness is the heart I have every day. That love for him for giving me what I didn't deserve. And I gave my life to him. And I forgave people. And I asked for forgiveness. For my kids, for my wife, for my friends, for Manny, my ex-wife, I asked for forgiveness right up on that stage before I got baptized. Some of you guys were probably here. But I had to do it before I got in there because I was about to become a new person, a new creation in Christ. And I didn't want that to go unsaid. 
<clears throat> but all those fears I had before, it makes me feel a little better because the disciples, they were the 12 guys that Jesus handpicked to start the church and spread the gospel, and they had that fear. So that makes me feel a little better, that they felt those same things. Because after they had fed the 5,000, Jesus made him get in the boat, which I think is kind of funny because it actually says in Scripture he made him get in the boat. So evidently they were like, ah, last time we went in the boat, you took a nap and we almost drowned. <laughs> so maybe we'll just take the shore this time and we'll meet you over there. But when Jesus tells you to get in the boat, you get in the boat. So he did get in the boat. They all did. And Jesus went up to the mountain. And he watched them, always watching them while they were out there. They weren't alone. But the wind was picking up, the waves were getting bigger, and they were rowing and rowing, but they weren't really getting anywhere. They're out there for like eight or nine hours, if you add it up from the time they had left until that, almost that next morning when the sun came up. That's a lot of rowing. I don't know if you've ever been on a rowing machine. I'm about 30 minutes and my arms are kind of tired. They're out there for eight or nine hours. So they were soaking wet, they were exhausted, it was pitch black, and that's when Jesus decides to go out there and have a little talk with him. So he snuck up on the boat, jumped up, and went, boom! You guys got punked. Save your style. Well, maybe that's not what he said. But he did say, take courage. It is I. And I could see him being scared, being tired and wet and exhausted, and just seeing something come out of the corner of their eye. I mean, that happens to all of us. If I'm out walking around at night and someone jumps out, it's going to startle you. It's a reaction, but then there's Peter who takes it a step further. He says, Lord, if it is you, call me out onto the waves. And that's kind of where I am right now. I, my heart belongs to Christ. This life I have, this body, it belongs to Jesus. And he's calling me to ministry. And I'm going to step out on the waves. It means taking risk. It means leaving a good job. A John Deere, it means leaving insurance. It means putting my trust in him, my life, my family, in him. And I'm good with that because I do trust him because he's always been there for me. And that love I have for him is the same love that Peter had. It's like when I... Uh, Husband and wife, it's uh, the first love. When you get on the phone and you're, and you're like, no, you hang up, no, 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 you hang up. It's that. First, you wanna be with them all the time. When you see them, you wanna be near them. And that's the love I have, like Peter did, when he saw him on the waves, <clears throat> he wanted to be out there with him. He wanted to go out there. And that's what I am gonna take, take that step. And there's a name for that, that perfect love. In John 4.18, it says, perfect love casts out all fear. And if you can find that love in your life, I know there's a lot of believers here. Maybe you haven't found the Lord yet. But if you have, you can have that perfect love with Jesus. And it'll take the fear away because he's in heaven and his spirit lives inside of us so we have that piece of heaven inside of us that's that peace that's beyond what we can comprehend that's that lack of fear that's perfect love so I just want my prayer is that you guys would know whatever you're facing in this life whatever past hurts you're holding on to Whatever, if it's a job or a family or a bad relationship, whatever you're going through right now in your life, maybe you lost a loved one, just know that you can have that peace because Jesus died on the cross for you, for all of us, no matter where you are. He did it for each and every one of us. And Satan's been defeated in death and sin and hell. If you follow him, you can have that spirit inside of you. It doesn't make sense to me that we can be afraid of those things that are defeated because you're afraid of Satan who's afraid of Jesus. But you can have Jesus in your heart and you can push that away. Don't believe the lies that he tells you. Just follow 
follow the truth, find that perfect love. Because this book doesn't change. This life changes all the time, but this book doesn't change. The message is the same. The love is the same. And the wind and the waves, they still know his name. He's still in control. So just give that control to him and trust him. I know I'm going out onto the waves. I just hope you guys can come with me. So as you heard in his story, how, how do you learn to trust? Be willing to step out of your comfort zone. It doesn't have to be big things. In fact, I think you start with the small things. You, you see the progression in Chad's life. It, it, it took him multiple different people speaking into his life before uh, the big change, the, the big change that happened in his life where he was able to actually say, Jesus, this is me. This is all of me. He, 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 he got baptized three different times. The first two, not really even understanding what Christianity means. God took him as he was and continued to work in him and change him and move him a, a little bit further and further each time. And then, then, then a few years ago, he, he said, I'm all in, right? He, he, it took, took a while for him to, to say that. And then God continued to work in him. He, he started helping out on, on Wednesday nights. He started singing with the worship team. He got baptized here. It, it started slow. It, we have to start with the small things. We don't have to always give everything up all at once. All those, I've heard some people that do that. Jesus takes you as you are and changes you and molds you one step at a time as far as you're willing to go, one step at a time. Now, Peter was that same way. Peter started out, uh, you know, fishing, right? And Jesus says, come, come, come follow me. And Peter left. He followed him. But there was a lot of times where fear still controlled the decisions that he made, right? You remember the time that Jesus was arrested and Peter brings out the sword and cuts off the soldier's ear. That, that, that was led by fear. He was scared. That led him to, to take things into his own hands. He didn't trust what was going on. He didn't trust that Jesus couldn't take care of himself. He didn't trust that, that, that Jesus would be along with him the whole way. Peter was scared after he got arrested, and, and what happened? He denied Christ, not once, twice, but three times to, to, to a little girl saying, hey, you were with Jesus. I, I recognize you. You're, you're from Galilee. No, I, I wasn't. He was scared. He, he, he denied the Christ because he was scared. Like I said in the beginning, we cannot let fear make our decisions for us, but Peter was there. There. And he let the fear make his decision for him. But it didn't stop there. Because a few days later, Jesus Christ rose again. And that fear suddenly, suddenly took, was, was, was away, right? When, when, when Peter saw Jesus for the first time and had this conversation with him, Jesus came up to him and said, do you love me? Peter said, yes, I do. And, and Jesus asked him again, Jesus, or Peter, do you love me? And if, he said, yes, I do. And Jesus asks him for the third time. And that this, Peter was a little bit hurt and didn't really understand why he was asking him three times. But if you deny Christ three times, it probably is, is a little bit significant that you say, I love you three times. And things started to change. And it was from that point on, that fear was put aside because he knew that Jesus was resurrected, that Jesus defeated death, that he was now living eternal life. This is something that he could never have comprehended while sitting in the boat and there was a storm around and Jesus was sleeping. Or when Jesus, Jesus came walking out to him to, to come to the boat and said, Peter, come on out. He still feared because what? He looked away and he started to drown. It was Jesus that picked him up. But the fear was strong still in Peter. 
It wasn't until after the resurrection that he was all in, or that he didn't have any fears anymore, that he went all out and did the things that God was asking him to do. You know, this, this is a commandment that Jesus puts, or, and, and God puts all throughout Scripture before and after the resurrection, but it didn't make sense until after. But even in Deuteronomy 31, 6, it says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. This is a promise, but it's not just a promise to, to not fear. It says, Be strong and courageous. It takes it to the next level. There, there, there's something that we can have that we can be strong and be courageous in spite of our fears. We don't have to let our fears dictate who we are. We don't have to let our fears control who we are and what we do. We can say, fear, go away, because I have the Savior that I know that can lead me through anything. Right? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. We sang that song early. That is the promises of God. It wasn't just a song. It comes from Scripture. It's true. And not only that, but it's part of the Great Commission because he says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's, that's why we don't have to fear because he's going to be with us every step of the way 365 times it says this in Scripture. Why? I think God knew. I think God knew that it was being written 365 times, one for every day. You can be afraid on leap year, which is coming away, coming up this, or you can read one of the other 365 options in Scripture. But God is there because He's alive. He defeated death, and we have no longer anything to fear. So, what can we learn today? What can we learn today? Not to let fear dictate make our decisions for us. But also we can learn something about God. We can learn that he is trustworthy. That we don't need to fear because we can trust him. We can trust him. I want to ask Seth and Jenny to come back and they're going to lead us in one more song. But I'm going to ask you today, do you trust him? Do you really trust God? Are you in the situation that the disciples that that you trust him up to a certain point, like, like they did before the resurrection? Or, or, or are you all in? Are you understanding that, that, that God will be there through it all? No matter how tough times get, no matter how hard things become, are you there? Do you trust God? Maybe some of you have never said that you will give your life to Christ. Maybe today's that, that, that day, and maybe this song will lead you to, to, to possibly think about that, that decision. May, maybe maybe you, you've been in church for a long time, but you've never said, God, I trust you. Maybe today's that day. Lord, we give you our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. We give you everything. So Lord, be with us today. If there may be anybody here that wants some prayer, say, Nathan, just pray for me. Pray, pray that I'm able to trust. Slip up a hand so I can, can, can know who to pray for. Yeah. It's hard to trust sometimes. Maybe there's some of you that said, uh, Nathan, I, I, I've I've never gave my heart to Christ, but this might be the day that, that I do that. Just slip up your hand if, if that's something you, you might want to do. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we glorify you, and we give this to you. Cast out our fear. Work in our lives. Work in our hearts change us, mold us into your creation because you defeated death. We need to live in the side of the resurrection, not in the side of, of, of intimidation or fear. Lord, we love you in your name. Amen. This lit week, live on the promise that you don't have to fear because God gives you life eternal. His, his resurrection symbolizes that for you. So go, love God, love others, serve all, and don't give in 
to fear. Have a great week. Amen. <laughs>